and welcome Hoosier fans to this week's edition of Assembly Call Radio, where each week we discuss the most interesting topics in the world of Indiana basketball. This is our 172nd edition of Assembly Call Radio, and it is our 626th, easy for me to say, episode overall of the Assembly Call, recorded on the evening of Thursday, June 4th, 2020. I'm your host, Andy Bottoms, filling in for Jared Morse, who currently is without power and may be joining us later. Uh, But let's begin this edition of the Assembly Call, how we begin every edition of the Assembly Call, and that is with our Who's Your Proud banner moment. And I will not take credit for this, but Jared had taken the time to to write it up and I think shared some of the same thoughts that uh, I had and would have highlighted, so I'll just read through uh, what he had put together. This week's banner moment occurred on Tuesday when the IU men's basketball team released a video with the description, racism in no way, shape, or form can be tolerated. The video opens with Race Thompson, a native of Minneapolis, describing how he had attended two peaceful protests in his hometown. It continues with each of Race's teammates and coaches speaking portions of a statement condemning racism and pledging in Armand Franklin's portion to become, quote, an inspiration and example. At least two Hoosiers, Joey Brunk and Trace Jackson Davis, followed through on that pledge by attending a protest in Indianapolis supporting equality. If you pay attention to Archie Miller's public statements and press conferences, a phrase he often uses is that he wants his program to, quote, be about the right things. I've always taken him to mean this in a basketball sense, you know, the usual stuff, working hard, playing together, being tough, executing, prioritizing academics, staying out of trouble, etc. But this week, being about the right things took on a whole new meaning, and he should be proud that the young men he coaches rose to the occasion. I know I am, and I hope you are too. With that, let me introduce my esteemed co-host for this week's show. To my left is the coach, Brian Tonsoni. He remembers the days when a movie cost a dollar. Heaven help you if you ever decide to pop your collar. Play hard, but remember, fake hustle is a crime. He's the coach, and it's Tonsoni time. Coach, what are your thoughts on, we, we typically make this the week in IU basketball, but given what's going on, I'll let you take it whatever direction you want. It's still that, muted, Coach. That direction yeah, should be with you unmuted, though, whatever that direction so, is. We want it so unmuted. Here, here we go. Uh, I, I think of the word community. Uh, we, we have a community here at, at Assembly Call, and, and we all take care of each other. And I think that's that's where I'm leaning towards. Uh, obviously, we put out a statement uh, this week, and, and I was honored to be with each of you guys uh, uh, as signatures on that statement. I think Indiana Athletics has done a really nice job of, of reaching out and appropriately making statements. I know um, you mentioned the basketball video. Coach Allen's done a really nice job, I think, the athletic department. And it's just a time where – you know, there, there is a lot of struggles. Uh, we have the health issue. Uh, we, we have, obviously, the, the loss of George Floyd, that issue in, in our country right now, and we all need that community, and we all need to respect each other inside that community. And, and un- unfortunately, when things like this happen, sometimes there's some bad situations, and we lost a former football player in Chris Beattie um, uh, to a mindless shooting in Indianapolis uh, recently. And so that, that, that hits uh, home real close. But Indiana University is, has had some history of some good uh, events and activities, and we'll talk with Bill Murphy here coming up on that. And they're also in the 60s where, where some struggles. So uh, I, I look at what we do and, and our fans and, and the love of Indiana basketball as a time to, to get together and, and focus on, on athletics, but really focus on realizing that we're all – in this together and that we all should have each other's back. And, and that's where I'm at at this point of a, of a very difficult, uh, 10, 12 days. Now you're muted, Andy. <laughs> never lifted a finger. He's got all the well, let me quickly add just one thing about this. The dude just interrupted his own jingle. Following that bit of karma for me for giving Coach a hard time about being <laughs> muted and then not muting myself, we have Ryan Phillips. Ryan, your uh, your thoughts on the last week? Um, honestly, I, I think uh, it's just a tough week to talk basketball. We'll do it, but it, it is. I mean, with everything going on in the country, and and um, I would say that I I'll, I'll echo that I was very proud of Indiana putting out the statement it did, and and the basketball program, and on all those players participating, and then seeing. So many of the players at Indiana being active, you know, civically um, and, 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 and you know, being out amongst the community. I think, uh, 
you know, if, if you're where you are right now, wherever you are in the country, I just obviously stay safe and, and stay, you know, smart and everything, but, you know, definitely this is an opportunity for a lot of people's voices to be heard and a lot of people to try and make change and, and make some things happen. I mean, wherever you stand on all these issues, I think that we've got a heightened sense of community right now. And, and I think that there's a real opportunity as it comes around every once in a while, every, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 years, there's an opportunity to make change and to step up and, and do some things and, and make this country better and improve things. And, and I think we really have a chance to do that right now as a nation. And so I would, there's people out there I know who don't know what to say or what to do or feel paralyzed, but there are resources out there for you to sort of find your way in this, even if you're not somebody who's going to stand on a corner and make a public speech or um, you don't feel eloquent enough to write a statement or anything like that. There are other things you can do to step up and, and sort of fill that void. So um, I would just recommend that everybody, you know, educate yourself and, and find ways to contribute to making things better, regardless of what you think that is. Um, get engaged and try and make things better. And, and I think that as citizens of this country, we should all be doing that a lot. But we get reminded periodically that maybe we're not doing that. And, and this is a time period where I think we can all step up and do that well said and uh, as coach mentioned we do have a special guest with us with us tonight bill murphy uh iu historian bill i don't know if you have any any opening thoughts here uh as we get things started well i appreciate uh the opportunity to be with you all tonight uh to talk about some of the things we're going to talk about especially uh george telefer and bill garrett uh bo mcmillan branch mccracken and uh, President Herman Wells and what they're going to do. But I think it's important for us to remember that we are a human society and that we're all basically the same and we need to treat each other uh, with that in mind, that we need to treat each other the same. So I'm really excited that we're kind of entering into this this evening. So thank you for having me. Yes, we're uh, we're glad to have you. Uh, not not glad enough apparently to get theme music for you uh, for your intro, but we're definitely glad to have you and uh, and and look forward to chatting with you a little bit more. That's all right because I'm old enough that you did have theme music. I was a silent movie. <laughs> Nice, nice. All right, well, here's what we're going to talk about this week. Uh, we've got a few uh, college hoops headlines. We did learn another piece of the IU non-conference schedule. Uh, as mentioned, we've got Bill Murphy here to share more about the legacy of two of IU's most prominent and influential African-American athletes, uh, which seemed very timely and, and a lot more uh, important to discuss than basketball this week. Uh, and then we've got your questions, as we always do. So we'll have that all coming up this week on Assembly Call Radio. But before we get to all that, we've got a few quick announcements. Uh, please continue to support our friends at Home Field. You, know, you can go to homefieldapparel.com uh, and use the promo code ASSEMBLY20 to get 20% off your purchase. Uh, they just released fleece sweatpants made out of the same material as the bison hoodie. So now you can literally drape yourself head to ankle in the most comfortable clothing material ever created. Uh, and there have been many people retweeting back to uh, Home Field that despite the temperatures rising uh, as it gets to be a bit warmer everywhere else, uh, that, that's not deterring customers from wanting to uh, to put on the new fleece sweatpants and uh, and all that. And I uh, I placed an order that I just got last week. Uh, got a, a, a Dayton shirt for our uh, neighbor who is graduating and going to the uh, University of Dayton. So uh, he seemed to seem to appreciate that. It was wearing it the next day. So uh, catching on here in Cincinnati as well. Uh, and if you want to support a local food bank, uh, feel free to go to foodpantries.org to find uh, ones in your area or go to feedingamerica.org as well uh, if you're able to donate. Obviously, uh, as Ryan mentioned, there's a lot of other ways to, to help um, the other causes going on uh, right now. We did put out a statement earlier in the week. Uh, if you go to our website, uh, or our Twitter, um, you can see that. And um, there was a NAACP site that uh, that we highlighted in there as well. I don't have the web address in front of me on the run sheet, but you can find it uh, any of those places if you uh, feel compelled uh, to donate there. So in terms of uh, IU headlines, uh, first thing that came out was uh, on Tuesday, November 10th, uh, assuming that everything is rolling by then, IU will play the New Jersey Institute of Technology uh, for the season opener. They finished last season 296th in Ken Palm. Uh, and uh, Jared had a few notes here. Uh, apparently, they've got some good names. San Antonio Brinson. And this is clearly a setup for me to have to uh, say this, but I believe it's Sulan Diakite. Sulaman uh, Diakite is the way I would have said it. So good job, okay. Andy. Good. 
Yeah, this was clearly a San setup. Antonio I don't think... Brins- San Antonio Brinson's a heck of a name. That's, that is a that is a good one. And yeah. And they also boast a five nine guard who uses almost thirty percent of their uh their possessions. So it could be interesting. Um, but a, a, a fairly um easy season opener. So a little bit of schedule news. I think that's the third uh, home non-conference opponent that has been uh, released at this point. So probably a couple others uh, to come as things keep going. But the bigger news uh, was really around voluntary workouts being able to start back up as of Thursday, June 18th. So a few bullet points here, uh, you know, a series of pre-participation protocols before they can actually even be cleared to participate in these voluntary workouts. Uh, among those requirements, they must complete a daily medical check, agree to abide by a series of CDC guidelines to complete the reintegration process and be cleared to participate in voluntary workouts. Uh, all workouts will be strictly voluntary. IU athletics will emphasize the voluntary, voluntary nature of the workouts to the students. Uh, and they'll be conducted in accordance with safety protocols, uh, governing the workouts themselves, um, both before, during, and after, uh, the actual, um, workouts themselves. Uh, again, this includes daily medical checks, social distancing, and face mask, face mask guidelines, uh, guidance on the group size that they can have together at one time, facility capacity, um, and a number of different things around cleaning the actual facilities themselves. So a number of schools and, and conferences coming out with, with statements about that. And, you know, Coach, I'll throw it to you first. Any major takeaways from that? Um, I, you know, it feels like they're following as many of the protocols as they can while still trying to get things open back up. Uh, in the same way that a lot of other businesses and things like that are. But anything strike you in particular as you, you read through the different um, kind of timeline and requirements? No, I, I'm just pleased that uh, Indiana is trying to do it as safely as possible. I'm sure that's the, the, the way it is around uh, the country because if you start out in a, in a method that promotes safety, it's going to last longer. Um, to, in, in a rush to get back to, to where things um, have been, uh, just back to normal 100%, then you could open yourself up to having to shut down again. One of the things with all of this opening up for me is I, I would rather not shut down uh, the things, and especially in sports. So I think it's good for the athletes. I think it's easier for basketball than it will be for football it's sheer, by sheer number of players. Uh, and, and then as a coach, for the number one thing, Andy, for me is get the kids back in a place where they can be monitored in the weight room as opposed to going to a gym where the, the, the health situation might not be as controlled as possible. Uh, yes, I, I would like to see shooting and ball handling and the, and the basketball drills uh, be enhanced, but the number one thing is going to be be in shape. Uh, and under you know Cliff Marshall's guidance, I think you can get a few guys in at a time, maintain social distance, wipe things down. But And then the bigger thing for, for all of us, and, and it just feels – difficult just talking about basketball this week but it might just be a good way to to get away from things is it's we all kind of need sports uh, i'm looking forward to the golf tournament next thursday one week from now um and, and i think just just getting some reports about players being back on, on campus and having the likelihood of sports at some point in an appropriate way uh, health wise is going to be beneficial for for a lot of reasons so i, I think indiana's doing it right uh, i think they've always done things right when it comes to uh for the most part, with uh, medical issues, and when it hasn't, they've addressed it. So, uh, I think this is a good plan for for the basketball program and for all IU athletics. Yeah, I think that it's the the key is going to be doing this in a smart, healthy way. You've seen a couple football programs have now come out saying that a number of their athletes have tested positive for coronavirus and, and things like that. And look, the statistics show that those people aren't at a super high risk if they're young and healthy but it's still not a risk worth taking, you know, that, that, that you're the one out of however many that, that could get seriously ill from it. And, and people have at those, that age gotten seriously ill from it. So it's, it's really about protecting the athletes and that has to be the number one priority. Um, you hope that again, doing voluntary workouts, solitary with everything cleaned up and, and all that stuff and keeping the numbers down and all that, that you can basically delay long enough to where we know more and, and can, you know, approach this, continue to, you know, implement approaches that keep things, you know, safer and safer and safer as we go along. So it's a great step to obviously say that voluntary work is going to be there. It's great that Indiana is emphasizing these are voluntary. You do not have to go. Uh, and, And it's also, you know, as, you know, athletes continue to come back to campus, continue to work out and exercise and do all those things. It's, vitally important that programs continue to monitor their health 
isolate them if they get sick and give them everything, give the sick players everything they need, give the well players everything they need to keep from getting sick, all of that. So um, just a very important step here that if you're going to do this, you do it right. And I think Indiana is impl- implementing the recommended protocols and all of that stuff. So it's really just going to be about let's see how this goes because it's a chance. You're taking a chance. It's a risk, all that stuff. But if they can do it the right way and keep everyone healthy, that would be a you know kind of grand slam for everybody. I think the most yeah, important right. thing is what when you find people who are sick uh, and, and what's the procedure there? Because anytime you open right. up, the likelihood of someone getting um, – the COVID is probably going to be there. And it doesn't mean that you're not to open up. We can't prevent everyone from getting it, but we can do it safely even when people uh, get it. That's going to be the key for me opening up education. You know, what's our plan when someone or two or three people get it for their safety and the safety of everyone else. And I think Indiana has, has an idea what they want to do. And and most places do. Yeah. I think you have started to see that a little bit with some of the other, I think Oklahoma state was one um, that, that had a couple I, I don't think it was players. I think it might've been staff, but um, you know, a couple of folks do that. And so they've got to have those in place, be able to enact those quickly and, and do things like that. Ryan, one quick question for you just to, to wrap up on this from a, you, know, you guys are covering this at the, at the big lead, all the different variations of things that are out there. I mean, anything unique that you saw about what I use doing maybe compared to other programs who have made similar announcements or is everybody kind of following each other's lead and, and trying to do the same kinds of things? Here's here's sort of where I'm at. And somebody asked me this question on Twitter and I was just like, you know, everybody it feels like is doing the best they can with the information they have. And it feels like there's pretty standard things like, you know, wipe down everything and take players temperature and test them often and all those. Uh, I use seems to be in line with what the more uh, progressive, protective people are doing. And I think that it's really, it seems like it's by conference. You know, it's sort of, there's a general consensus of these are the rules. You do these things where the matter is implementing them. I mean, the UFC went down to Florida and did an event where it said, we're going to do this, 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 and this. And then halfway through the first night had thrown half of them out the window. You know, there were going to be no in-ring interviews. They were going to, you know, there were, were, everyone was going to wear a mask and all these things. And that went out the window right away. So it's a matter of sticking to it and not just giving up on it when it's not convenient. And so I think that's the big thing for me is, you know, keeping focused. And once you commit to doing something like this, you got to do it and you got to do it right because the point is protecting kids. You know, it's not, this isn't, you know, adults, you know, guys in their thirties who are going to make their own decisions for themselves. These are athletes who are on scholarship who feel like they have to play and, and do all these things. So let's make sure they're protected. Yep. I would agree with you. So we'll uh, we have more to come on that as we you know hear more as there people are actually back. But uh, for now, the plan's in place, and it'll be up to everybody involved to execute that and keep everybody as safe as they possibly can. So coming up, uh, we're going to take a trip down memory lane with uh, our friend Bill Murphy and remember a few Hoosiers whose courage, resolve, and excellence had a demonstrable impact on race relations at IU and college sports at large. Stick with us. Nice of him to throw in demonstrable there when I haven't read through it. That was nearly, a, <laughs> nearly, nearly tripped up there. All right. So uh, how's so everybody that. holding up? <laughs> <laughs> let's be, let's, let's be honest. I, I said <laughs> yesterday during work, I only wrote two things yesterday during a full work day. And I just, I'm mentally exhausted. I am tired. Like, I just, I can't, my brain is not working, you know, the way it was. I, uh, I think we're all ready to get sports back, aren't we? Oh, yes. Yeah, I think, I think that'll at least provide a distraction. Right. I mean, even when they had the challenge thing on with, with, um, you know, a couple weekends ago, I was like, I, that was as much golf as I've watched in probably the last oh, three years. And it was, it was one like, day oh. and a couple hours, you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do, I mean, with everything, I, I feel the same way, just kind of mentally exhausted and, you know, I, it, I found- it's so easy to just get, I think Jared posted something about this the other day and in, in reply to somebody, it's like, it's so easy to 
I, I have not found a good way. I'll put it this way. I've not found a good way to strike the balance between staying informed and kind of up on what's going on, but not plunging so far into it that it like consumes you and getting depressed. Um, and, and it, I think that has been like that, that to me, I have not figured that out yet. Maybe other people have, but uh, <laughs> I think that's been kind of the challenge. Like you can't disconnect from it because that's not any more helpful than, you know, being, completely consumed by some of it but i think that's been challenging just to try to get breaks of like all right well let's do something normal because i think jared posted something about just going for a walk with his daughter or something like that and just doing something like that for a couple hours just to be like okay this is normal this is a, a mental break from i've i've taken to taking massive mental health breaks from things like i turned on i have a, i have an xbox i turned that on for the first time in like two years just to like <laughs> shut off everything it's not i'm not even a big fan it's just something you know it shuts off the world for a while and uh it's just been I, so you know crazy and um wow i i just hope I, I, honestly the reason i brought that up i just hope everybody out there's doing okay because i know a lot of people are getting depressed and losing hope and and all that and well i've um, been very lucky because I, I go down to Florida and visit my two one-and-a-half-year-old and two-and-a-half-year-old grandsons, and that keeps you very sane or drives you <laughs> insane, one or the other. <laughs> keeps you on your toes at the very least. For sure, yeah. yeah this is, uh, that, talk about a distraction from the real world. <laughs> you know, every and, time it, – it's funny. Every time I FaceTime with my sister, she has four kids, and her and, and my brother-in-law, when we talk to them, and they're up on everything. Like, they are watching the news. They're up, and they, you know, have opinions and whatever. And I'm just like, how do you guys find the time? Like, because they've got four kids. They're educating two of them. One is in, you know, like, fifth grade. Two of them are in, I think, first grade or kindergarten. And then they've got a, a younger one. Below that. I'm like, how do you guys, how can you think, let alone like keep up on the news? It's well, the two and a half year old, we get down there and the two and a half year old looks at us and says, Castle closed, castle closed. You know, he's, he can't go to <laughs> Disney World, you know, so the castle's closed. He saw up there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I think I remember chatting about that with you at, uh, at the meetup about that they're, Right there, close to Disney, right? Am I remembering oh, that yeah, correctly? Yeah, they're a mile and a half from Disney, and okay. that's my daughter's work. Is she, she she works for a place called Give Kids a World, and they bring in all the kids that have life threatening illnesses and accommodate them for a week. So they're all oh, about that. Awesome. Yeah, it's really neat. Right now, they're having problems because they can't bring any of the kids in because everything's closed down. Yeah. I found the NBA, will be, yeah. NBA will be there soon. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the front porch has been my uh, new office. <laughs> front front porch and horse racing. There you go. Yeah. I found I found out that uh, FanDuel will allow you to bet on horse racing. So oh, there you go. <laughs> I have been studying and reading up, and I, so far I'm, I think I'm I, I'm up. So you know, not big money, but. Uh, you know, but you're at least yeah, started yeah. down the road to, towards becoming a degenerate gambler. Then is what I it have it. Like. I put thirty. Hey, who says in? everything that's come out of this is bad? It's thirty dollars, <laughs> and I have still have more than thirty dollars in the account. That's, that's good. There you go. So if that's you good. drive by my house and see me leaning at the, you know, at the end of a horse race and yelling, "Come on, four! Come on, four! <laughs> uh, you're gonna see. We're gonna see Brian at football games, just staring at his phone, screaming at it in, yeah. in early fall football games. Just, exactly. Come on. Nice. Nice. <laughs> like, coach, the game's going on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. As, well, as crazy I'll... as Indiana is, they've allowed sports betting. I know. You know? And, and yeah. it's it, couldn't that's... buy beer on Sundays. For no, what? but you can bet on sports <laughs> on your phone. You know. And... <laughs> Uh, all right. Got a lot of ground, a lot of ground to make up and trying to make it up quickly. What are you going <laughs> to do? I fully support it. All right. So we've got, we probably can spend, I don't know, 25 ish. I don't know. 22, 25 minutes. How on long this. Was, so how long was the first segment? Uh, 1843 in total. Yeah, sounds so good. I figure if we leave ourselves six, seven minutes for questions, we got a, a few, but like I said, if they bleed into the end, so I'll kind of get started. Um, Ryan coach, if you've got questions, you either hop in with them if there's an opening or say something in the chat to 
yeah, kind of let sit, me give you an sit opening back mostly and let you let you go. But I'll uh, yeah, I'll kind of like I said, Bill. We'll probably start with uh, with George and then um, okay. do a little bit there and kind of wherever you want to. This is your uh, wheelhouse, so wherever you right. want to take it, and we'll time together as best we can and go from there. Okay, you just tell me when to start, and I'll get, take off. All right, I will uh, lead into you and uh, give you the on ramp, and then we'll uh, we'll see where it goes from there. Okay. All right. I gotta open this back up. All right. What's going on? It's Christian Wofford. What's the only thing better than an epic buzzer beater? Celebrating it with friends afterwards. Join my guys, Jared, Andy, Ryan, and Coach on the assembly call after every IU game. Go Hoosiers. And welcome back to the assembly call. You can find all of our content over our website, assemblycall.com. And if you ever want to join the chat mob during our unedited live broadcast or watch those replays and see all the between segment banter, then check out our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash assembly call. I'm Andy Bottoms here with coach Brian Tonsoni and Ryan Phillips, uh, as well as special guest Bill Murphy. And and this segment is going to uh, lean heavily on Bill as we go. But uh, as we talked about before, this has definitely been a, a tense and tumultuous week in our nation. Issues related to racial equality and justice have been at the forefront of the discussion, and with good reason. Uh, on Monday night, uh, our team here at the Assembly Call made our thoughts clear on the matter, stating that we stand right alongside those who seek to be not just anti-racist, but also pro-equality. And you can read our full statement at our website by going to assemblycall.com slash cause. Uh, and then uh, from there, you can find the uh, the link to, to donate that I talked about earlier. Uh and while our nation still has a long way to go to actually achieve real equality in terms of both treatment and opportunity for all people, it's also important to reflect on how far we've come. And because the lessons of that progress and the stories of the people who fought for that change can still teach us a lot about how we can take the next steps toward true equality. So tonight, uh, we wanted to reflect on stories and legacies of a few Hoosiers who helped push Indiana, the Big Ten, and college sports in general forward on race relations. And uh, from a player standpoint, that's Bill Garrett and George Taliaferro. And uh, their coaches, Branch McCracken and Bo McMillan. And so, as we said here, to help us do that is uh, none other than the official IU sports historian himself, Bill Murphy. And so, Bill, as we talked about, I, I guess it probably makes the most sense to take these in uh, chronological order, although uh, the times of, of George and Bill both did overlap uh, during their time at IU. But George, uh, I believe, came to IU in 1945 and was part of the, uh, to date, the only uh, undefeated Indiana football right. team finished nine zero and one. First game played at the at the Big House and actually beat Michigan. So uh, a number of things that have been uh, pretty elusive uh, for uh, I guess it, for IU IU and uh, George was able to do that within his first uh, his first season. But I, I guess tell tell the tell the folks a bit about um, you know kind of what brought George. Uh, to IU, um, obviously football was one, but you know, kind of how he ended up at IU and, and some of the his early experiences uh, as he came to Bloomington. Okay, that's great. Thanks, thanks a lot. First of all, uh, you know, he's going to come in 1944 because freshmen weren't eligible to play uh, sports at that particular time. But how did he get here? First, George was born in Gates, Tennessee, but he grew up in Gary, Indiana, and he was a star athlete in Gary. And Bo McMillan, who was from Texas, had a number of African-American players playing football for him even before George came. In fact, IU had a number of African-American players, and Purdue and Notre Dame had none. So we were kind of ahead of the curve in that. And Bo really wanted to get George down to Bloomington. So he sent another one of his uh, African-American players, a guy named Rooster Coffee, And he also was part of a uh, groundbreaking thing because when Rooster Coffee was at IU, African-Americans were not allowed to swim in uh, the in university pool. Now, there were occasional African-Americans who jumped in the pool without permission and this sounds really, really bad, but they would actually kick them out, drain the pool completely, and put in fresh water. That's how far we've come when you yeah. think about something like that. 
But Herman Wells, who was very progressive and was determined that he was going to integrate the Indiana University campus completely, he called Rooster Coffee in and said, hey, I want you to go swim in the pool. I'll protect you. Go swim in the pool. And he wanted Rooster to do it because he was a really, really popular athlete. He went in, swam, everything was fine, and that integrated the pool. So Rooster Coffee was the person that McMillan sent to tell George to, to try and encourage George to come to IU. And then there was another lady. Her name was Mrs. Parkham, and she was on the draft board at Gary, Indiana. And she kind of told George if he went to IU, he wouldn't be drafted. Now, this is 1944, so it's at the end of World War II. So those two factors brought George down to IU. Uh, Bo McMillan accepted him. George was standing along the sidelines at, at the first practice. And he asked, because some of the other players were so much bigger than he was, he asked Bo, he goes, are they the same age with as me? And Bo said, yes, they are. So they, his first initial experience in practice is that we ran what was called the cockeye tee. And it was something that Bo McMillan had come up with. And so they called a play for George to get the handoff and try to run upfield. They gave him the ball. He ran upfield 80 yards for a touchdown in the very first time he touched the ball. So they called it back. And Bo changed a few defensive things around. They gave George the ball again, and he ran again 80 yards for another touchdown. And Bo trying to think of something that he could tell his young sophomore, hey, you know, you need to work on. He said, you need to work a little bit more on running to the right. And George said, okay, but how was it for distance, coach? And, <laughs> uh, and Bo said, yeah, it's pretty good for distance, pretty good for distance. So, <laughs> So that was George, but George became an All-American at IU. As you mentioned, he played on that 45 team that was 9-0-1. The only blemish they had was the second game of the season when they had a tie versus Northwestern, but they beat everybody else. Um, he and Mel Grooms was, were the two African-American uh that were both in the backfield for IU along with Pete Theos. And uh, when we played Tulsa and we beat Tulsa that year, seven to two, but Tulsa was really, really uh, vicious toward both Mel Grooms and George Telefero because of, of their skin color. So IU goes undefeated. They have this big painting of the team that ha hangs in the Gables restaurant. Well, George was not allowed to go in the Gables restaurant because at that time, Bloomington was segregated and African-Americans could not eat in the Gables restaurant. And he would stand outside looking in the window, trying to see that picture. And he said he could see part of the picture, but it was really disappointing to, me, to him because he couldn't see himself in the picture. It was angled at such a way he couldn't see himself. So after his first year, he was actually uh, drafted into the Army, and he spent 1946 in the Army, comes back, he's released, comes back in 1947, and is playing football again at IU. Well, he goes into Herman Wells' office, and he says, you know, President Wells, I have a problem. President Wells says, well, what can we do? Well, how can I help you? He said, well, here's the problem. The problem is I've got a dollar a quarter in my pocket. I can't go to where I can actually go in and eat lunch and get back to campus on time for my class. And Herman Wells says, well, let's see what we can do about that. So he called while George is in the room, he calls the Gables and says, hey, I just want you to know that George Telefarum and I are coming to eat lunch at your restaurant today and there was a little back and forth and they were like well you know he can't come in and eat here because we don't allow african americans to eat in our restaurant and finally wells has had enough and he says okay i understand that's your prerogative my prerogative is that i'm going to make the gables restaurant 
off limits to every student in Indiana University. On that day, every restaurant in Bloomington became integrated. So wow. that, that's, that's one of my favorite stories about what uh, George had to go through, what he went through. He, his teammates on the team, people like Mutt Deal, uh, Pete Theos, um, they accepted him completely. Bo McMillan was great to George. He, George had the utmost respect for Bo McMillan. And then as he ended his career at IU, George did something, became a, a real footnote in history because he's in, have, at a restaurant in Chicago and one of the other players walks in. He's got something behind his back and they're like, well, what do you got? What do you got? And he said, guess who the Chicago Bears drafted? And they're all guessing. George said, we guessed a bunch of white players. And he said, finally, he pulled the paper from behind his back and he said, you know, showed the headlines, Chicago Bears draft George Telefero. He became the first African-American drafted in the NFL. Now, he didn't become the first African-American to play in the NFL because he had already signed a contract with the Los Angeles Dons of the All-American League. And he, he tried, he thought, how can I get out of this? Because the Bears were the team that, that was his team growing up. But he understood that the honorable thing to do was to go ahead and honor your contract. And so that's what he did. But a year later, then he does, he does play in the NFL uh, as uh, a member of the New York Yankees football team in the NFL. And he would also play in Dallas, and then he would end up playing for the Baltimore Colts and would be uh, an all-NFL player and just was a tremendous athlete. But, uh, but he, he broke the color barrier in the NFL. It was a really big step. So that was some of the things that he did that were really, really important. And go ahead. Yeah, yeah, well, so so before we uh, before we talk, Bill Garrett, yeah, that what I was struck by, you know, reading more about George was, you know, even at IU, he led them in punting three years, I believe, led them in wow. rushing twice and passing once, uh, played defensive back, um, returned kicks, did did basically everything, and um, I, I guess you don't get you don't get drafted in the NFL uh, if you if you're not really talented as a football player, but just seem like uh, you know everything that you read just what a phenomenal athlete and and something that uh, you you touched on him keeping that commitment um, to the to the dons. There was a couple of stories that that I've read about you, you know talking to his mom about that and and her kind of referring back to you know things his dad had imparted upon him and. Uh, his dad was a big part of you know, him staying at IU because he was, uh, you know, I think unsure um, for right. any number of reasons about, you know, whether he should stay, should stay, uh, whatever. So w we may talk about him a little bit more in the break, but I want to make sure we got a little bit of time to get to, to Bill Garrett here. So I'll uh, I'll keep us recording in between segments. So we'll, we'll circle back to George there. So okay. that kind of gives way um, to, to Bill Garrett, who um, – who broke the color barrier in the big 10 from a basketball perspective. Um, so I guess I'll kind of lead into to his the same way. Uh, and we'll, we'll certainly find some common threads here with, with Herman Wells going through um, this one as well. Um, but tell us a little bit of the backstory of how Bill Garrett um, came to IU and, and was put in that position to break the color barrier in the, in the conference. Yeah. A uh, real interesting story is of course, Branch McCracken was so popular throughout the state and he was asked on a number of occasions to be a speaker. And when Bill Garrett was a junior at Shelbyville, uh, Branch McCracken would come and speak at Shelbyville. And Bill Garrett was being honored uh, to receive the Paul Cross Award for being a student, an athlete, and a gentleman. And McCracken spoke that particular day about the qualities he looked for in an Indiana basketball players of talent and intelligence and discipline and good attitude. So, you know, he's speaking at a time when Bill Garrett is sitting there listening to him and they really don't realize at the time that their paths are going to cross real soon. So 
in 1947, uh, after after Bill Garrett has is Mr. Basketball, uh, a man named uh, Fabian uh, DeFranz, who is the executive director of the Indianapolis Senate Avenue YMCA, he and six other African American friends come down to Bloomington and they go to Herman Wells' office and they said. Uh, how would you like for Bill Garrett to come and play basketball at IU? And Herman Wells says, we'd love for him to come play basketball at IU. And they said, well, the only thing is that he can't play basketball at IU. And Herman Wells says, well, why can't he play basketball at IU? And they say, well, because there's an agreement between all the Big Ten basketball coaches that they won't play an African-American player. So Wells says, well, let me see. So Wells meets with Branch McCracken, and his first question to Branch is, how would you like for Bill Garrett to play at IU? And Branch said, I would love for Bill Garrett to play at IU. But the problem is, if I bring Bill Garrett down here and play, all the other Big Ten coaches are going to ostracize me, and they're going to shun me and, and, and push me out. And Herman Wells says, uh, here's what we're going to do. You go ahead. You want B Bill Garrett. You take Bill Garrett, and I'll take care of the coaches because I'll talk with the presidents and make sure that nothing happens. So uh, in the meantime, DeFranz and the rest of these guys are meeting with McCracken, and McCracken says, yes, I will take him. And they shake McCracken's hand. They say, you're, gonna, you're never going to. Uh, be forgotten for this. This is wonderful. So now Bill, Bill Garrett comes to IU. And in his sophomore year, the first year that he's eligible to play, one of the very first, uh, about midway through the season, we have a game in St. Louis. Now, the custom at that time is for any university uh, team that comes, the African American players stay in one hotel and the white players stay in another hotel. Well, IU walks into the hotel and the manager comes in to McCracken and says, he can't stay here. And McCracken says, well, he's going to, we're going to stay as a team. If he can't stay, we're leaving. And at that point, the uh, hotel manager says, okay, you can stay. So that was the first part of that is that through McCracken standing up for Garrett, they get to stay all get to stay in the same hotel. Well, then the players decide that they're going to go uh, down and eat dinner, but they're told that they have to eat in a private dining area because they don't want people seeing all these players, white and black, eating together. So the players said that's not acceptable to them. And these are guys like uh, Lou Watson is one of them, and they get up and they leave. And they walk down the streets of St. Louis until they find a restaurant that will accept all of them. So then, and another of my favorite stories that happened uh, with equality uh, that IU was trying to have with Bill Garrett and the rest of the team is they're playing at Northwestern. This is a couple years later. They're playing at Northwestern. And they tried usually to stay at the university areas because they would be accepted. Everybody could stay in the same building. Well, they walk into the Morrison Hotel at Chicago and they walk in and the manager gets from behind the desk, comes out, puts his finger into Bill Garrett's chest and looks at McCracken and says, he can't stay here. McCracken, who was a big man, he was six, four and a half. He was a big guy. He gets so enraged, he lunges for the guy. Well, now the guy's scared to death. He jumps over the desk to hide from McCracken. McCracken jumps over the desk after him. The only way he doesn't get him is several of the players grab McCracken's legs, and they're keeping him from, from getting after the man because they're afraid that if uh, he gets to him, that they won't have a coach for the game the next night. So... McCracken and the players, they, 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 everything calms down and they leave and they go to a different motel in Chicago where they can all spend the night. Now, 
Garrett was an All-American. He will be the last 6'3 All-American center in the United States. You know, after that point, the centers are much taller than 6'3. But Garrett's three years, Indiana was 14 and 8, and in fourth place in the Big Ten his sophomore year. They were 17 and 5 in third place in the Big Ten his junior year. And his senior year, Indiana was 19 and 3 and 12 and 2 in the Big Ten. And really, five ga- with five games left in the season, they went to Illinois to play against Illinois in what was going to determine who won the Big Ten title that year. Illinois would win it at 11 and one. IU would be uh, or 13 and one, and IU would be 12 and two. But in that game, IU was ahead with six minutes and 40 seconds left in the game, and Bill Garrett fouled out, and Illinois would go ahead and win. 71 to 65 but kind of a a telling thing at the very end of his career when uh he was he was being honored at shelbyville after the season of course this is still uh late winter early spring in indiana we have those great snowstorms and they had a huge snowstorm that shut down many of the roads but mccracken was able to get to shelbyville the speaker that was supposed to be there that night couldn't be there. So McCracken pinch hit and he spoke that night and he, he said many wonderful things about Garrett, but he said he was a perfect example of sportsmanship and a gentleman. And, you know, that team, Bill Garrett's last year at IU actually finished seventh in the nation. And Bill Garrett would leave IU as a number as a, all-time leading scorer with 792 points, replacing a guy that had been his teammate for two years, Lou Watson, who had 757 points uh, when he left IU. So uh, Bill Garrett weathered, just like George Telefero, they weathered a lot of obstacles, were extremely successful, uh, and helped break the color barrier at IU. Of course, Bill Garrett became the first African-American to start and play in the Big Ten in basketball. And it it was quite an accomplishment uh, for him. Now, Bill Garrett did not play professional basketball because uh, he would be, he would go into the army. He, He would actually be drafted by the Celtics. He would go into the army. And when he came back uh, from the army, uh, he had been cut by the Celtics at that particular time. He would go on and actually coach high school basketball, Christmas Addicts, to a state championship and be the only Mr. Basketball to win a state championship and coach a state championship high school team. So there's a little bit about uh, two of those uh, outstanding people and some of the contributions that uh, Herman Wells and Branch McCracken and Bo McMillan had made in the process too. So uh, it's not to say that IU hasn't had, that we haven't had uh, our bumps along the road, but we can really look with great pride at some of the groundbreaking things that we did as far as uh, race relations were concerned. Well, I'm going to, if, if you'll stick around with this a little bit, Bill, I'm going to uh, call an audible. We typically would use uh, the third segment to kind of hit questions um, that people have submitted. And we do have a few, which we can either hit after the show or hold till next week. Cause they're not, none of them are, are super time sensitive, but um, figured maybe we could use it and it maybe only be, you know, 10 minutes or so that we can uh, put on the, on the radio at least. And we'll, we can do more for the podcast, but uh, kind of have you come back. We can ask a few questions, talk a little bit more about these guys and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, other stories that you may have about them. Uh, I feel like we could probably go on for a while and you, you <laughs> certainly jammed a lot into this, uh, into this segment, but, uh, figure we'll, uh, keep it going. If that's, if that's all right with you. Oh, that's so, with me. Yeah. All right. Awesome. All right. Well then, uh, when we come back on the assembly call, we'll talk a little bit more about the legacy of Bill Garrett and George Talaferro, uh, with our special guest, uh, Bill Murphy, uh, stick with us here on the assembly call. Twenty-four, fourteen. 
So let me just see how much time. Well, you, well, you do math. I'm going to ask Bill a question. Um, sure. Bill, after Bill Garrett breaks the color barrier for IU and the Big Ten, did right. it open? Did it open the floodgates, or was it sort of a slow trickle of African American players? It was a players? slow trickle. Yeah, that usually tended. I mean, knowing the history of sports, that that tended to be the case. Right. It was a slow trickle. It really was. Um, IU had after after Garrett. IU had several African American basketball players that played uh, for a while, and it's it's really kind of interesting because. Um, you know, in the 60s, we had the black player revolt on the football team in 1969, which uh, I, John Pont and I talked about that quite a bit before his passing. And there was, it, it was very interesting uh, what happened with some of that. But uh, the basketball, a lot of people think that Lou Watson uh, didn't, that there was a, a race problem. Uh, his last year coaching at IU, and that wasn't true. I mean, there were there were dissension in the there was dissension in the program, but one of the problems was that a lot of the players felt like that Lou Watson had a special favors for George McGinnis, and you know, really, truthfully, why wouldn't you? I mean, <laughs> he's good, you know. But I'll tell you a story about Lou Watson real quick here. And that is that uh, when Vern P Payne was playing, and Vern played in 1966, 67, 68, um, there was a, a game. This was, of course, McCracken had just retired. So Watson had taken over. And there was a game when Vern was out on the fast break, really, really way ahead of things a quick pass and he has an easy layup and the player and Vern would never tell me who the player was. Uh, he's too much of a gentleman for that, but the player, the white player didn't pass him the ball. And so when they came to practice the next day, uh, they start to go on the court and Watson says, hey, everybody in the film room, they all went in the film room and the film was set for that particular play. And he played it over and over again for several times. And then he said to them, he goes, boys, the only color that counts in this building is red and white. And if I ever see that again, the player that is guilty of that will be off the team. And Vern Payne said for the rest of the season, his head was on a swivel because so many passes were coming his way. <laughs> And it wasn't that Vern was bad. Vern was actually, uh, and you guys would not know this, but way back in the 60s, they had what was called the Little All-Americans. And if you were under six feet tall, right. you could be considered for a Little All-American. And Vern was part of the Little All-Americans, along with a guy named uh, Calvin Murphy, who was a pretty good player in his own right. Was after Bill Garrett was the next African American star at Indiana? Was it Walt Bellamy, or was there somebody before that? Because I, I mean, my <laughs> knowledge of the program doesn't go back that far. Um, okay, yeah. Unfortunately, I actually saw those guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's not unfortunate. No, you're well, lucky. Actually, I, count, I count my blessings that I in, I came in at the end of Schlunt and Leonard, and from then have seen. I mean, I'm starting my 66th year as a season ticket holder. Wow. Wow. So, um, but, uh, there was, uh, there was, um, I'm trying to think of his name. Walt came, but Walt was not the next guy. Well, Hallie Bryant mm. from Indianapolis addicts would have been the next, uh, big player to come in big star to come in and play at IU. And I mean, Hallie was a great player. He really was. He ended up playing for years with the Harlem Globetrotters. Gotcha. Bill, how tough was well, it? Bill on... Garrett played. Bill Garrett played for the Globetrotters for a little bit, right? I mean, it was a yeah, short stint. So. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah. How you, you shared some stories about the travel? How how tough was it, and what what did these gentlemen have to do, and and Herman Wells and Coach McCracken have to do um, on campus? Because it, uh, as you mentioned. Um, with the, the the restaurant um, situation, yeah. but how much work did they have to do for for him just to be able to be comfortable 
spending four years going to class and doing doing those things uh, at a time when it wasn't widely accepted to to have an African American on campus or in in athletics. Yeah, well, I was actually I was actually thinking something similar to that. So why don't we why don't we use that question in the okay. segment to kind of lead in sure. okay. and then. Uh, Bill, I will tell you, we've only got, if my, well, this is a bit, potentially a big if, but if my math is correct, uh, we've got about six and a half minutes total for this segment. So I'll try to be quick with the intro and then coach, I'll just kind of throw it to you for that question. And then we can kind of hit that. And then Bill, I'll just jump in when we get to a point where we got to wrap up and then we can keep going afterward. Um, oh, yeah. but I, that, I think that would be good. That was one of the questions I had. Cause in some of the you know, reading about, uh, you know, George was like, well, when am I going to go to the, you know, wh where do I get, to, how do I get to the dorm? And it was like, well, you can't stay in the dorms and right. different oh, stuff yeah. like that. That would be, be uh, would be good. Homes outside of the university. Yeah. So, all right, well, let's hit some of that stuff and then, uh, and then we can kind of keep going afterward, but that was a, a good question, coach. So I'll, I'll throw that back to you once we uh, get rolling again here. All right. Um. Hi, this is James Blackman Jr. I never miss an open three, and I never miss an episode of the Assembly Call. Go Hoosiers! Thank you, James, and welcome back to the Assembly Call. I'm Andy Bottoms here with Ryan Phillips and the coach Brian Tonsoni. And remember, you need to be subscribed to our email newsletter. We send out weekly IU news roundups, even during the offseason. And after every game, we send out a detailed post-game analysis. So text IU to 66866 or go to assemblycall.com to subscribe. All right, this is where we would normally do our mailbag, but we wanted to uh, keep talking about uh, a couple of uh, trailblazers for uh, IU and and, and really in athletics in, in general, in uh, Bill Garrett and George Talaferro with our special guest, Bill Murphy. And so I uh, wanted to use this time to at least get one, maybe two questions in for Bill, and then we'll uh, we'll tack some others on to the end of the podcast. But uh, Coach had, had a good one in the uh, in the chat or in between segments, which I cut him off from, or I cut Bill off from answering for the purpose of using it for this segment. So, Coach, I'll, I'll throw it to you for that. Yeah, Bill, both um... – George and Bill faced some things athletically that were restricted, but what was life like in Bloomington and campus and, and what did they have to do and what did uh, Herman Wells have to do to get these guys to, to feel at least somewhat comfortable uh, to attend for the time that they did? Well, that's a great question, coach. And I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to let George Telefero's words speak for uh, himself and that, and I'll just kind of quote him, but George would, would say that when he came to IU, he faced a lot of discrimination. And he said, you know, there were times when he really wanted to go home. And he said it was tough. But he said he thought, and this these are his words, that he thought that putting up with the discrimination he put up with to get the education that he was getting at IU was worth the sacrifice. So uh, in his mind, and, and you know, you have to understand, George was a terribly bright person and would go on to do great things and, and eventually come back and be a professor at IU. He would, uh, his, he's ended his career playing with Baltimore and went into the public education of Baltimore at the very uh, in the uh, beginning of his new life, you might say, but he just understood the value of education and what it could do for him. And so he, he was worth, he said it was worth putting up with that discrimination and, and Bill Garrett, you know, what these guys had to go through is it's hard to imagine today. These players, these early African-American players we're not allowed to stay in the dorms. There were African-American families and other families that weren't African-American that would put these players up uh, in their houses um, it, off campus so that they had a place to stay. Uh, my grandmother had uh, one of those houses and uh, a couple of them would stay in the upstairs of her house. 
uh, as well. So uh, it was it was a, a tough road to hoe for these guys. We we don't know what it was like, but to them it was worth doing uh, for the education. Do we know how long that kind of lasted at, at IU before they were allowed on campus and dorms and um, in, in regular, either the athletes or, or regular students? By the by, the middle fifties, uh, it was uh, it had gone away, and they were allowed to uh, stay in campus. And a lot of that, a lot of that, I mean, people do not realize how progressive. President Wells was, and I could spend a whole segment or a whole day just talking about Herman Wells and all the great things he did for IU. But one of those things, and Herman Wells had a student named John Stewart back in the middle 40s who was his first student assistant. And Herman Wells would say uh, that he opened up, he was an African American. And he opened up for Herman Wells' uh, eyes as far as what was going on and the prejudice that was taking place and uh, the burdens that these uh, players and students, just uh, African-American students, faced. And so uh, Wells was very, very instrumental. In fact, uh, Wells was quoted as saying, you know, I don't care about uh, what's happening in England or China. Uh, I care that we integrate Bloomington, Indiana, and Monroe County. That's what I care about. Yeah, that was one of the things, and, and we're a little short on time, but a, a couple of things for people. Um, there's a lot of great stories about Bill Garrett and Herman Wells in particular uh, in, in the book Getting Open. Uh, right. So if you want to look that up um, by Tom Graham, it's a, it's a good read and one that gives some of the background of that. It talks about uh, a bit about how – Bill and George crossed paths um, the, while at IU, and and Bill was able to learn uh, from some of the things that George had already uh, endured. So, uh, with that, Bill, um, I, we will keep you around uh, afterwards to, to talk a little bit more after. But from a radio perspective, uh, we'll wrap things up. And I really appreciate you being here and uh, sharing these great stories. I'm sure everybody enjoyed them and could uh, listen to them for quite some time. So, we really appreciate you joining us. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate being on. All right, and with that, that will uh, do it for tonight's episode of the Assembly Call. If you wanted to see us do the show live, join us at assemblycall.com on Thursday nights for the live broadcast of our Assembly Call radio recording. And don't forget to go to assemblycall.com or text IU to 66866 to join our free email newsletter. Special thanks to Bob Thompson for producing most of the music you heard on the show, and thank you for listening. I'll talk to you again next Thursday night. Till then, keep your elbows in, keep your eyes on the rim, and take care of each other. Hey guys. Hey. Hey, I, I want to share this with you because I've I, I always hear you play that music at the end, and all I can think about is a win in a football game and the marching hundred turning their hats backwards because that's what we did when we won a football game in the fifties and sixties. They turned their hats backwards and played that song after the game. <laughs> Awesome. So, Bill, I, we won't keep you all night by any means, but uh, right. Right. figured we could you want me. we could we could chat a little bit more. And I know uh, eventually Ryan will need to eat, and uh, and I will, I will probably need to go to bed. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> but figured we could chat uh, just a, a little bit longer, another you know 10, 15 minutes, or, or right. whatever the case may be. So. Um, yeah, I don't, Ryan or Coach, or I don't know if anybody in the chat had questions. I could not, I could ill afford to have another window up while I was doing this. So I don't know if there are questions there or if you guys had uh, anything else that, that you wanted to touch on um, as, as we uh, we talk through the, the legacy of uh, Talaferro and, and Bill Garrett. I, I tell you, Talaferro was a, was a wonderful human being. Uh, we, we both sat next to each other at the, um, Mellicamp Pavilion back in 2007, he was signing his book and I was signing my first book over the Rose Bowl team. And we just had wonderful chats and 
He's such a great guy. He really was. But that Minnesota game, he had three touchdowns. He didn't even play the last quarter. And one of those touchdowns was an 80-yard interception that he ran back. Yeah, some of these, as you're reading through different uh, tributes to him uh, from when he he passed away in uh, 2018, right? Um, right. And uh, yeah, just some of the yeah some of the things about that were yeah the Minnesota 82 yard interception return, 95 yard kickoff return, um, yeah. in the same game. I, I love the like led in punting, also, also led in rushing and passing. I think in the same season. Um, yeah. the the number of like and and this happened a lot back then. It was your best player did everything, you know, oh, and yeah. it seemed like he played every he did whatever you needed him to do. And, and the crazy thing about that particular team is George was a great player, but they had several great players. Pete Theos was an amazing All-American on that team. And then you had a guy that became a tremendous baseball player, Ted Klazuski, played on that team. And here's a name for you, a guy named Bill Buckner played on that team. His son is William Quinn Buckner. <clears throat> huh. Did so, not know crazy. that. So uh, the Buckners are the, uh, the father-son Buckners played on the two undefeated IU teams, the 45 football team and the 76 basketball team. <laughs> That's, yeah. And, and Isn't it... Um... It's it's fascinating, and no no avenue is is perfect. Um, but how how many times we're talking Indiana University and how progressive they were, but it was with it was through athletics led to changes elsewhere. Um, right. You know, I, I, and I know people sometimes look at me like I'm too involved in sports, and but the, you know when you go to a sporting event and sit down, we we're all Indiana fans, and, and that's right. uh, you know kind of a lesson today. But what what courage these guys had to have. And what courage um, Wells had to have in order to uh, to you know call in whatever he had to do or to put his foot down to what he had to do to get these athletes on on campus to start making change that that's that's the fascinating part for me as as well as all of their accolades um, in, in athletics is that um, and this was you know um, at a time that was earlier than the, than the nation was really accepting of that of of all kinds of change. Oh, yeah. I mean, we had Talaferro and Garrett at the same time that Jackie Robinson was integrating uh, Major League Baseball. And in fact, Jackie Robinson played for UCLA and we, IU, beat Jackie Robinson in UCLA in basketball uh, during that time, too. So, but no, one thing, and then I'll I'll shut up because I know I've talked way too much, but... Uh, one thing Herman Wells did that I started doing when I taught is that he signed every IU diploma. He hand signed every single one of them, which is pretty amazing when you look at thousands of people. Going yeah, it's, through. it's kind of a big school. To, it's yeah. must have gotten worn out. <laughs> yeah, so. Well, I, I want to say I, something about oh, well, Wells real quick. I mean, just yeah, you're, you're good. Bill, I, I, I wonder if you can confirm this, but everything I've ever read about him just seems like he didn't care what people thought. He was going to do what he thought was right or thought was smart for the university or, you know, he oh, didn't yeah. really care what the detractors ever had to say. Oh, no, he totally, he totally, it was all about IU. That was, you know, he was never married. Uh, his mother lived with him, uh, but he was all about Indiana university and there's a great book, uh, that was written while he was alive. In fact, I've got it signed by president Wells. It's called being lucky and it's, uh, his biography and it's, it's amazing. It really is. And a side note, and I, I put this in my branch book. Um, my, he, he enabled my grandmother who worked at IU she became the first female at IU to get paid the same as a male for doing the same job. So, you know, that was, so I, I have great admiration for Herman Wells. Yeah. Have you, you, you were mentioning in books and I, I saw that 
there was a, a, a book from last year that came out about George Tally Farrow, the race in football in America. I haven't read it, so I didn't speak to it. I have read getting it open. I don't, I don't know if you've read that one or would have any recommendations on it for anybody or, uh, even just people looking to learn more about, about these guys. Um, like I said, getting open, I thought was a, a really good view to a lot of what, you know, Garrett's upbringing, how he, uh, eventually got to IU, the role that Wells played and, um, a number of the I things that as far as that you relayed, but I wasn't sure about George. In my book branch, I did one chapter nine is about the Bill Garrett era at IU. Um, uh, but yes, getting open, I, I, I own that book and it's great. And then I would highly recommend uh, the book, Breaking Barriers, uh, about George Telefero. It, it's also okay. a tremendous book as well. It really is. But um, yeah, I mean, I mean, Bill Garrett was amazing. He died way too young. He really did. He was, I believe, now I could be wrong on this. But I think he was 45 when he passed away of a heart attack. It was I, I want to say you're right. It was in that range, um, yeah, as I recall. I'm still, too young. I'm close. I'll, yeah, I'll I'll look it up here just to, just to confirm. Yeah, he was yeah 45. Um, you were, well, you were I'm glad correct. to know that I remembered that. You you got a, a good memory for any of this stuff. Yeah, so I've I, noticed that. I don't know why I looked. Has he ever if it wasn't if it wasn't for you, if it wasn't for you saying you weren't sure, I wouldn't have even bothered to look it up. I would have just taken your, your word for it immediately. But uh um so as we as we kind of wrap up, any other um you know, a, a story uh, about either or both these guys of just um one that sticks out to you that you didn't get to share uh, before or of, of, you know, I think that the things that they were able to endure in, you know, as you said, in George's case, really focusing on the education and, um, and and those kinds of things, I think Garrett had, I feel like there were similar comments and themes in, uh, in getting open of, of kind of the, the greater purpose of what they were, were doing and what they were forced and, were forced to endure but put up with in the name of furthering what they were trying to do any stories to that end stand out to well, you as we as we kind of wrap things up i know um you you know you guys are all of the age with don fisher and and uh john laskowski and uh doing most of the broadcasting and uh before that we had uh, Max Skirvin, who uh, I know quite well. In fact, he and my parents went to school together in Bloomington. But uh, there was a guy who did Channel 4 even before uh, Chuck Marlowe or before uh, John Leskowski. His name was Hilliard Gates. And he did a lot of broadcasting. And Hilliard Gates would say uh, that he thought it was a match made in heaven with Garrett coming to IU and playing for McCracken because, you know, they, they were the hurry and Hoosiers. And so Garrett, even though he was 6'3", but he was a great rebounder. He was a great rebounder because he knew how to use his position, not his size, but he would position himself to get great rebounds. But, uh, you know, he would run up and down the court like a deer and uh, it just worked perfect to be in McCracken's uh, racehorse system uh, that that we used at that particular time. Yeah, it, it, the, some of the, the stories about, uh, you know, in, in getting open just of his, yeah, like you said, you know, the 6'3 center and, and doing those kinds of things was just, you know, kind of crazy, but talked a lot about the angles of rebounding and different things like that. I think one of the things that was him, if I'm remembering this correctly, in my memory of reading this book, um, even just a few years ago is probably worse than your memory for virtually any of the topics that we've discussed tonight. But, um, <laughs> I seem to, I seem to recall, and I don't remember whether this was high school or college or maybe both. Um, but situations where he was in some ways targeted by officials, uh, in the way that, that he had to, you know, kind of keep his composure in situations like that. So as not to, you know, give anybody reason to, you know, perpetuate 
stereotypes about about African Americans and different things like that. Am, am I remembering, remembering parts of that correctly? correctly. And, and in fact, they, you know, I was talking about the Illinois game his senior year. You know, he fouled out with just over six minutes to go in the game. And we were ahead when he fouled out. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk that, you know, they, they fouled him out because you've got an all-white Illinois team uh, versus an Indiana team. And, you know, it was for the Big Ten championship, and they really kind of wanted Illinois to win it, not IU. Now, you know, it's, it's kind of like you go and you do uh, 92 with – uh, Duke and IU and everything, and you can go through all that. But you know that you're exactly right that he was targeted not only by the players, who gave him a lot of sharp elbows along the way, but he even had to endure uh, officials, two officials that were out there that sometimes uh, did not give him the benefit of the doubt at all. So, so how would as you think about the role that the coaches played? Um, in these these different scenarios, you, you talk a lot about Branch. You've written a book about Branch. You know a ton about him. Are there are there different thing? Are there are there commonalities between he and McMillan that really shine oh, yeah. through and allowed them to be advocates for something that, as we talked about before, was not really even happening in pro sports at that point. That they that they did to make you know nothing was made easy for for these guys, but to you know, to kind of open the, the door for this to happen? That's another great question. First of all, McCracken actually coached under Bo McMillan um, because McCracken actually coached the freshman football team uh, while during some of the time when he was coaching the basketball team. Not always, but uh, in the early years when he was coaching at IU, he coached under Bo McMillan. But the commonality that they had is both of these guys – you know, McCracken came from Little Monrovia, Indiana. Uh, they didn't, his parents were just poor farmers. They didn't have much. In fact, uh, Branch's uh, senior, junior and senior year, he actually didn't even live at home because there were so many people living at home that uh, he was kind of shipped off to a neighbor's house. And uh, Bo McMillan was just a poor kid from Texas who, uh, you know, so they both grew up poor and I think they had an empathy for some of the black athletes who came uh, to school who didn't have a lot. And so I think that that's a, a thing that you kind of, uh, as I've seen and listened and, and witnessed and talked to some of the players and everything, you could kind of get that feeling that they had. Uh, that in common as well. And I think, you know, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And then again, another part of, of getting open, I feel like I'm the guy who's like, Oh, Hey, I read a book before, but, um, you read so, a book, but, Andy. I know it's hard to believe. Maybe it is it's worth telling. Who's to say, it's really um, book, Andy. it is, I, I finished it and then I gave it to my dad to read and, uh, and have, have passed it around a bit. So, um, so with, so George had, um, you know, went, was in the service for two years, right? Before he came back, or was it just one? One year, just one year. It was one year. And he was, yeah. and that was around when he came back, that was around the time that, that Garrett started. So those guys, you know, George really took him under his wing, as I recall, and at least tried to help him navigate a lot of those things. And it had started, as you said, with some of the other players, even before who had, um, had worked through some of those things. So a anything you'd add on just kind of the, any, what the relationship was between those two guys and, and how, uh, what George did paved the way and, and kind of helped bill a bit, even though the sport itself was different. Oh yeah. No, it's absolutely true. You know, George, uh, who was very, very intelligent and Bill was too, but George would kind of take him under his wing and, you know, George's, second year at IU was in 1947 and he had had the experience of of not only playing in 1945 but in 1946 being away from home and being in the army so uh, you grow up even more and then you come back and he's playing in 47 and then 
Garrett comes in on Garrett comes in his freshman year in what would be George's senior year. So George not only is, you know, he's, he's older. And so he's been through the ropes and he kind of takes Garrett under his wings. And, and George would say that, you know, Garrett had a great deal of admiration for McCracken. So uh, that worked out real well. And George would kind of lead him through, this is what you can do. This is what you can't do. But by the time Garrett had come, uh, Wells had opened up the university. So Garrett didn't have, now he still suffered through it, but he didn't have all the uh, discrimination that George faced when he first came to IU. Yeah, it, it's amazing to think about, you know, we, we think about different times when we were there as students and struggles that you had and ways that you felt. And then to be under the microscope in so many different ways as these guys were without the same uh, privileges of, of other students, with Without the same accommodations as other students, um, just as uh, just both the amazing, amazing stories of uh, you know courage as as I think you alluded to uh, previously, and um, just yeah, really, really good stuff to talk about. And we thought that this was uh, a lot more compelling, a lot more relevant, a lot more important than uh, than talking through uh, maybe what we would have originally uh, originally planned a Rob Finnessy play breakdown or whatever, uh, whatever the case may be. So we, uh, can always table that for another week and, uh, and, and this, so we, Bill, we really, really appreciate you coming on and spending some extra time here at the end. And I just want to say one thing real quick, cause I know you guys are all one to go. Um, and I just cannot thank you enough because this is a subject that's really, really important to me. Uh, I told Jared, you know, my father marched with Dr. King. So uh, we kind of grew up in that household of, of what, uh, we ex- what was expected and what we would go through. So I really appreciate you guys letting me come on and talk about a really great guy in George and a great guy in Bill and uh, the help they had from the coaches and the president. So thank you guys so much. I hope I didn't take too much of your time. No, we no, had it was, to be on. Never. It thank was fantastic. You, uh, Thank you, Bill. It's always good to talk to you, and it's always good because there, there's so much history in, in many areas of Indiana athletics, and you're doing a lot to share it in a, in a wide array of, of methods and podcasts and everything. So thank you very much. It's always enjoyable to listen and talk to you. Well, thank you, guys. I appreciate yeah, Thank it. you so much for coming on. Yeah, so we uh, so just I'll, I'll kind of wrap with these couple things. I guess this is the second wrap up, so uh, I won't play the outro music again. But uh, for those looking to kind of hit up any of the the things that we mentioned, um, getting open was the book about uh, Bill Garrett. Uh, Bill Murphy's book, Branch, uh, the Branch McCracken story, as he said, has a chapter dedicated to that as well. And then the uh, the book about George Taliaferro. Uh, that uh, Bill mentioned is uh, Break Barriers from the NFL Draft to the Ivory Tower, and that was back from 2010 um, right. as I look through all these here. So um, if anybody's looking to learn more uh, background of these guys, um, that is a great way to do it. And if anybody um, you know, needs to learn more about those, that's a good, uh, good place to start. So uh, with that, that'll wrap us up. Um, Bill, thank you again so much. Uh, we'll have to have to have you back again because, like I said, I know you uh, could talk about these guys and any number of other uh, Indiana history topics. So we'll be uh, we'll be happy to have you back anytime, and uh, appreciate you joining us tonight. Thanks. Bill. Thank you very much, guys. Cool. And uh, thanks everybody for joining us. I uh, hope this was uh, interesting and and uh, heard some stories that you may not have heard. And um, like I said, just felt a lot more uh, a lot more important to to talk through things like this. Uh, tonight given everything else that's going on so hopefully everybody enjoyed it and uh, we will be back next week with uh, another assembly call radio so thanks for joining us everybody and uh, have a good evening see you guys later guys all right cool bill thanks again uh oh, thank and we will uh morning. no it was, was it was it was awesome um yeah like i said i it i was like there's really no reason for us to answer questions that we can answer next week uh about the current team then we could spend a little bit of extra time with you and then i i recorded the last uh 
segment of uh, questions as well. So we usually, Jared, when he posts the, the podcast, a lot of times we'll just post the whole the whole thing. We're only limited in time for the radio, so we get a little bit of studio space to yeah, explore with the other there. stuff. So it's a little bit... Uh, a little bit easier to tack some of that stuff on so we'll get it all uh get it all out there and and uh thank you again thank you very much guys you have yeah, a great thank you, bill bye guys yeah take care enjoy those uh enjoy those grandkids and uh everybody else we'll uh, see you next week great bye guys <laughs> bye all right see you